right. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? It's good to be with you. If you're just coming in, there's still a really nice section right here up in the front. We call it the splash zone. I'll let you figure out why. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is truly the most exciting day, not only in Christian history, but really the most important day in human history, where we remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And this is, it is an exciting Sunday. It's always an exciting Sunday. Uh, it's a momentous Sunday, and really for our context, it is a rather unusual Sunday here at City on a Hill, and it's unusual for a few reasons. Uh, for one, we have an unusual number of services. We normally only have a 9 and a 10.30, uh, and this morning we, of course, have three services uh, beginning at 8, which really, I, I think, proved to me more than anything else that uh, if you go to the 9 o'clock service, you no longer have an excuse for being late. Because you got here at 8, all right? Uh, you showed your cards. We have an unusual number of services, primarily because of the unusual number of guests as well. And if you're a guest with us this morning, I want to welcome you. Uh, glad that you are here with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Give them a hand. Um, we have an unusual coffee selection. We have a coffee truck outside today. We wanted to give our fabulous ladies who do the coffee and the food every week, the real MVPs of City on a Hill, a day off. And uh, yeah, we're, we're glad uh, to give them some rest. We have an unusual stage set up. We've been over the last uh, several months now through a verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of 1 John called Under Construction. And uh, this is the first morning where we are able to enjoy the, the new construction project, if you want to call it that. And we got to also enjoy the new and unusual baptistry, um, which we're very excited about. Yes. Um, it is always a privilege to, to celebrate baptism, and, and it just this morning, it really made my heart full seeing uh, various individuals respond in obedience to the Lord's commandment to be baptized upon believing, and their families were able to sit right here just a few feet away as they watched. And I think that is, in my mind, what baptism should be like. It should be intimate, it should be close, uh, up close and personal. So it was really exciting to see that uh, come together. Very, very exciting. It, there's a lot of reasons for why this is an unusual uh, morning, and it's honestly fitting because what we're going to discover in the text today is that the very first Easter Sunday morning was in and of itself an unusual Sunday morning. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 24. While you're turning there, I want to catch you up on the story so that you have the right context moving into this portion of Luke's gospel. On Good Friday, Jesus is arrested, he is interrogated, uh, beaten, and mocked, spit upon, and eventually murdered. And after Jesus dies, after he breathes his last, as the text says, Luke says that there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. And he tells us that this particular man named Joseph was a member of a group called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, by the way, uh, was the group responsible for the arrest and execution of Jesus. But Luke tells us that this particular man, Joseph, had not consented to their decision and action. So, um, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, but he was a dissenting voice in this vote on whether or not they should uh, arrest and execute Jesus. Now that Jesus had died, Joseph wanted to take his body and give him a proper burial. Luke 23 verse 53 says, then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. Matthew in his account, in his gospel of this part of the story, tells us that the reason why this tomb had not yet been used, which by the way implies that some tombs were used multiple times. I don't know what that means, kind of gross, but uh, this one had not been used because it was in fact Joseph's personal tomb. He had uh, had this stone carved out to be his own personal tomb. He donates this tomb to uh, the Lord upon his death. So it's, it's Friday, and the Sabbath is approaching, and we know that because of Luke 23, verse 54. It says, it was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. So it was Friday late in the afternoon. The Sabbath began on Friday, but not technically until sundown. So uh, you had the morning and the afternoon to kind of wrap your things up before sundown on Friday night in order to prepare for uh, resting on the Sabbath. So it wasn't technically sundown yet. It was late in the afternoon. So I want you to visualize this in your mind. Jesus has died 
the entire movement that was convinced that he was the Messiah are left in utter shock. They have no idea, like, what does life look like now? The disciples who had left their lives and their jobs and their well-being and their homes to follow him are left wondering, like, what's next? What does life look like now? Everything that we thought has changed. And there's this one guy a member of the Sanhedrin who voted against putting Jesus to death and now decides the least thing that he can do is give this man a proper burial, which would mean wrapping his body in grave linens and placing him in a tomb. Now, off in the distance, it says that there were women who loved Jesus and had followed him, and they were watching Joseph do the things that he was doing. It says, verse 55, it says, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then verse 56, it says, then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. I love, the, I love the honesty of this text. We have Joseph, a man, who was like, I've done well. I've buried this great man of God. And the women in the background are like, what a disaster. We have to fix this now. <laughs> He's done it all wrong. Women have been correcting men's lazy efforts for at least 2,000 years. Just, I love the honesty of that. Here's the problem they run into. It's beginning to get late, and the Sabbath is about to begin, and they they had to make oils and spices uh, for this anointing process for his burial, but they had to set them aside and wait from Friday night until Sunday morning before they could come back. And that leads us up to the first part of our story here today. Before they um, arrived, this unusual morning begins with an unusual discovery. Look at verses 1 through 3. It says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. Remember the spices that were on the shelf since Friday afternoon? Verse 2, it says, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. This was an unusual discovery, and really for a few reasons. For starters, when someone dies and you put their dead body in a tomb, You expect them to stay in the tomb, right? You expect them to remain dead. That's a normative practice in our life. He should still be there. He's not there. What has happened? This is unusual. But beyond that, it's unusual because of who discovers him. These are women. And in the ancient world, women had no real voice or ability to care for themselves or or independence whatsoever. They were to remain mostly silent. They couldn't even pray with the men in the temple. There was a separate place where they were relegated to pray. They couldn't own land. They couldn't take inheritance. They had no way, really, to advocate for themselves, which is one of the reasons why the New Testament tells us that True religion is caring for widows because widows would have been rendered helpless and without the means to take care of themselves. Women had no place of honor in the ancient Near East, and yet in the early hours of this unusual morning, it is women who discover the empty tomb for the first time. Now notice what the empty tomb signifies. Verse 3, it says, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Did you know, this is interesting, I had not picked up on this until this week, that this is the first time in Luke's gospel where he uses the term, the Lord Jesus. It's never found before this moment, and it's actually the singular time that it's found in Luke's gospel. Following the resurrection, he is the Lord Jesus. Two weeks ago, he was Rabbi Jesus. Last Sunday, Palm Sunday, he was Jesus the Messiah, the Son of David, Hosanna in the highest, right? Friday night, he was the crucified Jesus, but here... In the empty tomb, he is the Lord Jesus. It's the only time in Luke's gospel where he says that. Now, maybe you're thinking, maybe Luke just didn't prefer this term. Like, maybe there were other ways that he talked about Jesus' lordship. But if that were the case, you would expect Luke to not use it in his sequel that he wrote as well. Did you know that Luke's gospel had a sequel, by the way? This is real. I'm not joking. The book of Acts the book of Acts. So Luke is the author of both the the, the gospel according to Luke and the book of Acts. Both Luke chapter 1 and Acts chapter 1 begin with him referring to this individual named Theophilus. It's a one and two part series. We get the Lord Jesus title one time after the resurrection in Luke 24 and yet we find it 18 times in the book of Acts. It's not that he didn't prefer this term, it's that he's waited until Jesus has conquered death before ascribing that to him. You see, the empty tomb brings into clarity the true identity of who Jesus is. The people wanted a brilliant teacher, 
You know, blow us away with theology, Jesus. Give us, give us all the mind-blowing knowledge that you have as this great teacher, this great spiritual worker, right? And, and they wanted a, a miracle maker. They wanted someone who would come in and he would make the blind see and the deaf hear. He would multiply the, the loaves of bread and the fish. He would, he would bring people back from the dead even. Just a, a true miracle worker. They wanted a, a political revolutionary on Palm Sunday a week ago. They wanted someone to come in and overthrow Rome and bring back Israel to its former greatness, make Israel great again, right? Probably had the, and so, and, but only, understand, only the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords can be dead on a Friday and alive on a Sunday. Only the Lord Jesus can do this. This is an unusual discovery, and that leads next, notice, to an unusual visit. Verse 4, keep reading. It says, when, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Luke tells us how the women felt when they discovered the empty tomb. We like to think, you know, that, that they came into the empty tomb and, and they discovered that Jesus was missing and they immediately broke out into because he lives. Just immediately started singing hymns, right? That's not what happened. They weren't excited. They weren't rejoicing. They weren't full of faith. They weren't happy. The Bible says they were confused. They were perplexed, it says, by what they discovered. And I love the Greek term here, aporeo. It means to be without means. In other words, not only were they confused by what they discovered in the empty tomb, but they had no means of reasoning within themselves to figure out what it all meant. Now, I think personally, this is very, very good news for us. It's very comforting detail for me. I, I sometimes think that there is a pressure to be excited the moment God moves in your life, right? There's, there's pressure for that. And I'm not so sure that that's ever a healthy expectation. Like, I think the normative pattern is that we pray for God to do things that only God can do and then be super confused when he does them, <laughs> Like sometimes God will do something that's truly an answer to prayer that, that only, that you prayed for, by the way, that you have been praying for over and over again. And yet when God does it, when he answers that prayer, you're still like, what? Just completely confused. I got a, a message this week about uh, a particular individual that I had been praying for for years to come to faith. And in the twilight years of his life, he believed the gospel this week and was born again. Yeah. Years, years of prayer. And, and when I found out, when I got the message, I, I was obviously happy to hear that. But, but like my knee-jerk reaction was like, what? <laughs> you, you, what happened? As if I haven't been praying for this for like almost two decades, right? I'm surprised by it. Like, it, it blew my mind. I, I'm perplexed. Is this real, right? I mean, so it, here's what I, it's easy to imagine ourselves rejoicing when God answers prayer, yet I think more often than not, it freaks us out a little bit and it's confusing. It's easy to read a passage like this and think, these women should have been excited. I mean, they should have been going to tell it on the mountain, right? I mean, something, something spiritual and churchy sounding. But, but listen, you wouldn't have been excited either. You would have been scratching your head just as well. They couldn't make sense of this. It took intervention to get them to, to connect the dots. And who better, by the way, to intervene than two men in dazzling apparel. <laughs> Major mid-1970s Elton John vibes, am I right? <laughs> dazzling is actually a really remarkable word in Greek. Astropto, it's a word that means to flash as lightning. To flash as lightning, yeah, hence the lights. That was planned. That's what we were trying to <laughs> simulate here. Um, it's, it's Honestly, it sounds terrifying, doesn't it? And it was. Look at verse 5. It says, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, I'm going to just come right out and say it so that you're not, like, wondering. These are angels. Yes, they are angels. And, and look what they ask. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? In other words, you are looking in the wrong place for that which you seek. You don't go to a grocery store to buy a car. You don't go to a Mexican restaurant to order spaghetti. If you do, let's talk. Something's very wrong with you. <laughs> and you don't go to a seminary to find someone who is alive. But remember, these ladies were perplexed. They had no means within themselves to reason through this. And so the angels begin to connect the dots for them. Verses 6 and 7, it says, He is not here, but he has risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and rise. Now, notice immediately what do these angels point them towards? They point them back to the words of Jesus. They say, remember how he told you And then they share those things that he said. This is something that I do not want you to miss today. I do not want you to miss the importance of this. The reminder of the importance of Jesus' words in your life. Whenever you feel confused about what is happening in your life, what God is doing, uh, the circumstances, you're having a hard time making sense of like, what should I do next? You turn to the word of God first. Period. You turn to the word of God. I cannot tell you how many countless times people have been going through some life situation, some difficulty, something that they're trying to navigate, and they decide to make a decision that is, in my estimation, the opposite of wisdom. And when I ask them, why are you doing that? What led you to this decision? So often, so many of them respond with something like, well, I've prayed about it, and I just feel like this is what God wants me to do. (laughs) And it's surprisingly almost always the opposite of what God has already said in the Scripture. And I just want to be like, that isn't how it works. You can't just throw prayer out there as a cover for whatever you want to do. Because get this, this is always true. I want you to take this and think about this. The Spirit of God will always direct the people of God back to the Word of God. Let me say that again. The Spirit of God will always direct the people of God back to the Word of God. If the Spirit is pointing you towards something that is contrary to what is written in Scripture, that is not the Spirit's voice you are hearing. That is your voice. That is you, my brother or sister. When this happens, whenever this happens, I I always want to say to them, isn't it weird how God always seems to be leading you to do the things you want? (laughs) Like, have you not put that together, the suspicious nature of that, that God always is just teeing you up for the things that you most desire? That is a great sign. You are not hearing from the Lord. You are hearing from yourself. The Spirit will always lead you back to the Word. That's what happens here. The women have been reminded of Jesus' words, and that makes all the difference. Look at verses 8 and 9. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And that leads us to the next thing on this unusual Sunday morning. First, an unusual discovery of an empty tomb, followed by an unusual visit from angels, and third, an unusual story to be told. Look back at the second half of verse 9 and into verse 10. It says, They told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So the three women who began, remember, on Friday with the anointing spices and and then came Sunday morning to discover, they've now been identified as Mary Magdalene, uh, a woman named Joanna, who we were first introduced to in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, she is described as the wife of, listen to this, ladies, if you're having a son soon and you want to name your boy a biblical name, Chusa. <laughs> I'm just saying we have enough Johns, Marks, and Peters. We need more Chusas in the world, all right? It also says that uh, she was the manager of the household of Herod. And they are accompanied by Mary, the mother of James. Now, you won't notice this unless you're looking for this intentionally. And this is, forgive me up front, the nerdy part of the sermon. These are the kinds of things that I just love. I think they're really fascinating. But Luke here is in this portion of the text, verses 9 and 10, employing a Hebraic grammatical tool that was imported into Greek known as chiasm. Chiasm. It's a way of highlighting or in kind of giving a nod to subtly something that you want to point out. And you can really see it in the structure of how verses 9 and 10 are uh, put together. I get to show you on the screen. This is so helpful. Um, so notice that your A and A lines line up together. Uh, the B lines line up in the C. So in A, they reported all these things to the 11, and A, who kept telling these things to the apostles. B, and to all the rest. B, and the rest of the women with them. C, Mary Magdalene. C, Mary the mother of James. And tucked right in the center is Joanna. Just Joanna. Why? Why? What is Luke trying to show us here? Scholars think that because Luke comprised his gospel account based on eyewitness accounts, 
Scholars believe that this is a way of nodding towards Joanna as the source for this portion of the story. That she must have been the one that Luke interviewed, that gave her this information. And so when he first identifies them, he uses chiasm to kind of just a subtle nod to the source for this story. I just think that's really, uh, I think this is cool. It's cool how we, we find those little nuggets of information. Notice how this story is received. Verse 11, it says, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. The disciples didn't believe this. And they wouldn't believe this story until they themselves had their own unusual encounter with the Lord himself. And that brings us to our fourth point, an unusual encounter. There's actually two encounters that take place in Luke 24. We're going to focus on the second one involving the disciples. But I do want to say that the first encounter is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. It's uh, the two men on the road to Emmaus. It, it, it's, it's incredible. Jesus approaches these men uh, as they are traveling to Emmaus. It's a true undercover boss moment. They have no idea it's him. Uh, we, we don't know how. It doesn't say. It just says that he somehow prevented them from recognizing him. I like to think that he had one of those pairs of glasses with the fake nose and the mustache. <laughs> totally got him. What's great is they continue to have a discussion with, it's so ridiculous. Gosh. <laughs> what are we even doing? He has a he has a discussion with them, and, and at some point, he literally calls them idiots. And then he sits down with them to eat, and it's at the dinner table. He takes the glasses off, and he reveals his true identity. And before they can even comprehend what they're seeing, it says he vanishes. And Luke writes all of this with literally no explanation for how it happened. It's just awesome. It's an awesome story. I, in fact, one of my favorite parts of it is, is after he vanishes, they're talking. And I, God, I love this. He, one of them says to the other, did our hearts not burn within us as he spoke? It's like they, they're the human, like humanity, the, the anatomy of their physical bodies was responding to the presence of the divine Lord, even though cognitively they couldn't recognize him. They knew somehow Something is different about this. It's just an incredible story. Go ahead and read it at some point today. It will bless you. I want to focus on this second encounter. The, the two men, after they encounter Jesus, they leave from their place. They travel back to the disciples. And they begin to tell them what happened. Pick up in verses 36 and 37. It says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they had seen a spirit. I like how, by the way, Jesus has been dead for three days, and he just casually pops into their conversation and is like, peace, guys, what's up? <laughs> like it's a normal thing. Luke gives two words to describe their response. The ESV translates it startled and terrified. Uh, the Greek more literally could be rendered terrified and very terrified. <laughs> Look at verse 38. Jesus says, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. That is that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. It's a very theological detail that Jesus is giving us here. It's a very important one. He is proving that he is not simply a vision or a ghost or a phantom. One of the earliest heresies that creeps into the early church, history tells us, eventually becomes known as Gnosticism. John's gospel actually deals with this uh, quite a bit more in depth in the way that he writes and, and shows who Jesus is. But even here in Luke's gospel, Luke is including this detail in order to war against this heresy that Jesus didn't actually rise from the grave physically, but that he just sort of appeared as a vision or as a phantom. And, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Touch me, touch my body, see that I have fully risen, that my physical body has been raised. And then look at, at their response, verse 41. It says, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? I do love the fact that they are puzzled, they're afraid to believe, and Jesus is like, y'all got any food? <laughs> but I want you to notice this phrase. This is such an important and I think really just thought-provoking phrase. They disbelieved for joy. They disbelieved for joy. In other words, they still did not believe he had risen because of joy. That's a strange thing to say, isn't it? That's a, that's a strange thing to say. In other words, they were, they were afraid to feel joy that comes with belief, and so they, they didn't believe. They prevented themselves from believing. 
Who can relate to that? I, I mean, I think everyone, if, if we're being honest, can. Like, let me ask you, have you ever had your heart so broken, so devastated by something in your life, and right when you begin to try to process it, and you're starting to come to terms with everything that's happened, you get news about that thing that broke your heart, and that news seems almost too good to be true. Like, you didn't want to believe it, because you knew if you did believe it, and it turned out not to be true, you'd be even more devastated than you were to begin with. It's a form of self-protection. It's a form of protection, it, because what you're doing is you're, you're protecting yourself from feeling even more hurt that could come with believing something that's not actually real and, and kind of giving your hopes up. So you put up boundaries. I don't want to get excited about something that I'm not certain is true because if I do, it's going to devastate me if it's not. I think that the disciples, they didn't want to believe that he had risen because they didn't want the joy that would come with that belief to ultimately stab them in the back. They'd experienced this, this horrible loss I mean, their whole world had been turned upside down, and now they're being told that maybe at the center of it, something really spectacular could be going on here, but, but to believe it is a risk, isn't it? It's a risk, because what if it's a lie? What if it's not true? One of my favorite authors of one of my favorite works, apart from the Bible, is J.R.R. Tolkien, author of The Semmelrillion and also The Lord of the Rings. And Tolkien talked about what every great story needs to be compelling to the human spirit. In fact, he, he came up with a word for it. You know, he came up with whole languages. He was a philologist. I think he knew somewhere around like eight to ten languages. But he developed a word to describe this, this thing that every great story has. He called it a eucatastrophe. What a great word, eucatastrophe. He defined it as a sudden turn towards a favorable ending. He said that every great story should have a moment where it looks very bad for the hero. Like it looks like things are just collapsing, it's over with, darkness has prevailed. And right when you think that evil has won and the story is over with, there's a sudden turn towards a favorable ending. A eucatastrophe occurs. And it totally twists the reader up. It's totally unexpected and it's like almost hard to believe, hard to make sense of. It stops you in your reading. You have to kind of think about it for a moment. Oh my gosh, what did I just read? And he developed this term after reading the Gospels. He talked about how the, the cross is this moment in history that, that represents the totality of hopelessness and loss. And that within that dark moment, there is this kernel of joy. And that at just the right time, when all seems lost, it explodes into eucatastrophe, a sudden turn towards a favorable ending. But it's hard to believe though, isn't it? It's hard, like you want to protect yourself from believing that because the, the ramifications of that could just be so huge. And so, man, I, I don't know that I want to get too close to that just yet because if it's not true, it's going to really devastate me. You see, some of you have never believed the gospel because it's a risk, isn't it? I want you for a moment, we're going to conduct an experiment. You're going to hate it. <laughs> I want you for a moment to imagine in your mind the worst sins that you've ever committed. Only you know them, the things that you're most ashamed of, the things that you've said to other people that you deeply regret, the things that you've done to other people that you wish you could take back, the things that you would never dare tell anyone, the things that you would rather die than share with another living person. I want you to think about that in your mind. I think if we're being honest, and we're in church, we should be honest, I think you feel defined by those things to an extent. Like maybe you've tried to convince yourself otherwise, you've done the psychology and all that, you know, the, the self-help books, but, but deep down, you feel those awful things are an inescapable part of you. But then you hear the gospel, the message of forgiveness, the promise of being washed clean and made new, the promise of God's grace in your life, that no matter how bad you've treated other people, no matter how ugly you've acted to other individuals, that you could still actually be loved and accepted. And oh, it sounds so good. Almost too good. Almost too good to be true. Because you think, the moment I believe this, you know, that sounds great, but the moment I believe this stuff, the moment I lay my stupid guard down, 
People are going to find out who I really am. They're going to find out the things I've actually done. They're going to reject me. They're going to run me out of here because I'm, I'm so much worse than everybody else. And, and all of this rejection is just going to feel worse than I felt before I got into all of this. It's just too hard to believe. But listen to me. The empty tomb in human history says it's true. The gospel is true. And it frees you from it all. It frees you from the secrets. It frees you from the shame. It frees you from the guilt. It frees you from the loneliness that you feel. And for the first time in your entire life, you will feel fully loved and accepted by God because you will be. The gospel is this kernel of joy hidden within the pain of life. And when you truly believe it, it explodes into you catastrophe. You're jolted into a sudden turn towards a favorable outcome. Forgiveness, mercy, grace, freedom. The Bible says that every single person in this room has sinned against a perfect God. Every one of us. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do to make it right. There's no lengths that you can go to. There's no amount of good things that you can perform to undo it. And yet the gospel is God's promise to you that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection ushers in, makes available to you forgiveness for those who believe it. In fact, look at what Jesus says, verses 46 to 49. He says, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer And on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What is the right response to the empty tomb? It's to believe it and be saved and be forgiven and then to proclaim it to everyone else and not to do so in your own power, but through an unusual power, power from on high, power from the Holy Spirit that you receive upon belief. Paul says in Romans chapter 10 how this all happens. You want to know how? Here's how. Verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might be saved. Not you'll be temporarily saved until we look at your background and decide whether or not you're good enough to fit into all of this. No. You will be saved period, for eternity. The question this morning for you is, will you believe it? Will you believe it? Will this just be another morning for you where you go about your day and you do your own routine and whatever and tomorrow's Monday and it's a work day and off we go? Or will this be an unusual morning for you where for maybe the first time in your life, the scary proposition of the gospel is before you and you take the risk and you believe it? That's the question on the table. What will you choose? What will you do? Will you believe? Will you believe this news? Because here's the reality. Life is already really difficult, right? Can we agree to that? We're not going to sugarcoat it. Life is hard. Life is very painful. And by the way, when you become a Christian, it gets worse. Just (laughs) want to give you the right expectations up front. If you're on the fence about all this, it doesn't get better. But what if, tucked into the difficulty and the pain of the life that you are living right now, there was a kernel of joy waiting to explode into a eucatastrophe that moves you into this sudden favorable turn for a better ending? People, what what, what I want you to know this morning is there is And it is the gospel of God. And it is guaranteed to us by the empty tomb of Jesus. There's nothing you can do. There's no part you have except for just believe it. And let it explode in your life this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the the most powerful story ever told. The empty tomb. The son of God conquering sin and death the promise 
of forgiveness, of grace, of mercy for broken, sinful people like us. I pray this morning for those here that have never believed the gospel and that maybe for the first time, it's, it, it's just right there. It's right in front of them and they know, they know they should do it. They know they should buy in, believe, submit, bow in submission before the Lord Jesus. Would you give them the faith to do that? Would you soften their hearts and speak to them in a manner that only you are capable of speaking? Make it clear as day to them that they may be washed and made new, forgiven and set free. And that we would be able to walk alongside them as they learn what it means to live a life that honors you daily. Father, I rejoice that every day is the empty tomb day for Christians. We're gonna come back next week and we're gonna worship you in excitement just as much as today. But today, God, I pray for those who do not know your Savior Jesus that that kernel of the gospel of joy would explode in their life. How we love you and how we thank you in the powerful name of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. God bless you.